Okay, that's my rambling. Um, let's get into Chris's presentation. And I will say, uh, getting into this, it's uh, all of this stuff is available to you online. So uh, I'm going to blast through this for some of you maybe too quickly, uh, but it's all available online, and we're, we want to have uh, plenty of time to ask questions and discuss it. So. Uh, Chris is the manager of uh, Stormwater for Kitsap County. And he, uh, as, as we've said, did his PhD um, on Stormwater. So Kitsap County is uh, shown on the map here. It's right across Puget Sound from Seattle. So it's a rapidly growing um, residential area, commercial. Um, it's a quick ferry ride to downtown, downtown Seattle, so a lot of people live in Kitsap County, commute to Seattle, rapidly growing area. So, his presentation will talk about the problems caused by development, the potential solutions, and some quality of life um, considerations. And I really like this quote that he had on this slide. A positive attitude does not guarantee success, but a negative attitude virtually guarantees failure. So don't get discouraged. Keep keep working. Um, problems in Kitsap County, the same as anywhere else. Um, changes in stream flows, hydrologic modification, uh, water quality degradation from stormwater. Stormwater, we realized 15, 20 years ago, is the primary source of pollution in our waters, streams, um, the straits, Puget Sound. Um, fecal pollution in, is really important in Kitsap County for the shellfish harvest. Their critical shellfish areas uh, are closed to harvest because of fecal um, polyform. Stream habitat uh, degradation uh, and localized flooding in urban areas. So how did we get here? Uh, 1972, the Clean Water Act, Water Pollution Control Act. Um, 1983, the NERP study, National Urban Runoff Pollution, was really the first comprehensive across the country study of stormwater, and it, it was really the first one to really identify how many pollutants uh, and exactly what pollutants are in stormwater. Uh, As I said in my comments, in the 80s and 90s, we um, learned a lot about stormwater. And we often think of water quality as being the most important factor, but we've learned um, in this research that it's really the flows in stream systems that cause the greatest impact to resources. Water quality matters, it is an issue, but it's really before water quality becomes an issue, it's the, the changes in flow that cause the largest um, impact. So, we begin by learning about the water cycle and rainfall, what causes rainfall, what happens um, to the water when it, to rain when it falls, and um, a lot of it lands on the trees and never reaches, in a forest, never reaches the ground and evaporates directly back. What does reach the ground then splits uh, into, well, goes into the ground and into the shallow, maybe three to six feet of soil, that's called interflow, and the rest goes into the deeper um, ground aquifers. And that's, that's critical. And it was a major learning for us in the 90s that in most rainfall events there is no runoff until we get to about a two-year storm in an understood forest. And a lot of people still have a hard time kind of comprehending that. But that's really the crux of, of um, where our uh, first problems show up. 
in the early days, in the 1970s, we started requiring stormwater detention facilities, but they were designed for the 10 or 25 year storms. They were based on flood, river flood models. And when you design for the 10 or 25 year storm, that means it only does something once every 10 or 25 years. And we slowly recognized we needed to be addressing the everyday rainfall. So we lose, when we develop uh, a watershed, we lose the forest, we scrape away the topsoil where that interflow happened, um, we pave so water can't even get to the surface, um, we compact the soil, um, we, we make pavement, rooftops, sidewalks, um, all preventing the water from getting into the ground. So now it runs off. And every time it rains, it runs off instead of once every two years or less. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff fairly quickly. We can, as I said, the details, the numbers are in, in the slides. Um, they're available to you online. Um, What we find is when we have this runoff now, pretty much every time it rains, it really changes first what happens directly to the fish. They're not adapted to fighting against currents every time it rains. Um, and then it begins to change the channels themselves. And again, I'm going to, as I said, I'm skipping through some of the stuff to, in the interest of time. What we find is the stormwater peaks are now, the runoff is a much higher peak, and it also happens sooner um, after a rain. So in, an under, in a forested creek, there's very slow and very minimal changes in flows when it rains. In a developed creek, it runs off immediately. The peak flows happen quickly and our, the peak flows are much higher. And as I said, pollution is not the initial issue. It is an issue, um, but we need to learn about flows first. In one of the people that did really important research was Jim Carr, and he developed the Benthic Index of Biotic Integrity, BIBI. And that, this concept he developed in the tropics with birds first, and then in the Midwest with fish, and then he brought the idea out here, and we have fewer species out here than they do in the Midwest, so he had to shift his parameters, and he came up with the idea of using benthic uh, insects. And in studying creeks, a healthy watershed has a lot of caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies. An unhealthy urban creek doesn't have those things that has worms and water striders and beetles and, and other types of index, insects. So by developing this concept, he was able to sample at various levels of urban development the insects in the creeks. And this became probably still the best indicator of stream health. And this has now expanded this concept and is used all over the world. One of the one of the things that we learned is not surprising to that, that, that the health degrades with urbanization. But what surprised us was how quickly, and you see the vertical lines on the left of these graphics. Um, there's a significant decline when we go more intense than one house per five acres or two hectares, roughly. And that was a bit of a surprise to us, that how early the streams degrade. And when we see a change in the DIBI, we also see declines in fish. So the findings were the same. What we found was the ratio, uh, another indicator became the ratio 
uh, between the species of salmon and trout. Um, it changes very quickly, and the salmon tend to disappear in our urban creeks. And again, this is this is happening before water quality is an issue. This is just flow-based changes. So, the primary factor is the loss of forest cover. And then roads. Um, and along with roads, what we do, in, in addition to the, the impervious surfaces, we gouge out two drainage channels on either side of the road to get the water off the road and away from the road as quick as we can. What that does is it also pulls all that interflow out of the soil and shoots that, injects it straight into the creek. Urbanization happens fairly slowly, so we don't often really see it happening. We see individual buildings changing, but it's hard to see at a watershed scale how things change. Um, there's a number of other facts. It's not just flow and water quality. It's the loss of, of uh, riparian corridor, corridor vegetation. And again, through the science investigations, we realized that there's a lot of subtle things that happen. And we need, on the order of 200 feet, um, for shading, uh, for temperatures in the water, for the ecosystem, the, the critters that live there, um, to survive. Uh, we also found a strong correlation between the number of road crossings of a creek and the health of the creek. So, as Kim said 20 years ago, he and I were doing a lot of watersheds on the order of, uh, I'm sorry, symposiums, presentations, um, around 20 of them up here in British Columbia. And one day I was standing in the parking lot with Kim after a meeting and he said, what we need is a big graphic that shows watersheds developing and what happens. So Kim went back and created these graphics, which many of you have um, seen, and we showed what the watershed looks like, the changes in the impervious surface, the changes in flow, how the, creek, the peak flows happen much more often, much quicker and much larger, and the corresponding changes in the channel, the channels, instead of Lots of pools and logs and um, short little ripples, narrow channels. They get wider and wider and wider and shallower and shallower, which means there's, the rearing habitat's gone and the fish are constantly fighting the current. Um, and then there's the benthic index of biotic integrity and the water quality changes that go along with it. And the changes in species. And then we use these, working with community groups and watershed groups, to say, okay, where do you want your community to be? This is where you are in the continuum of growth. Uh, where do you want your watershed to be? And you can't get back to pristine. And it's unacceptable to lose all of the resources. So then it becomes a, a difficult um, decision balancing what, what we want versus what is realistic to achieve. So now we get into water quality. Um, about 20 years ago, people started noticing that coho salmon in the urban streams weren't even surviving to spawn. They'd come up in the streams and they would do this kind of really sad contorting um, and die before they ever had a chance to, to spawn. And pre-spawn mortality, uh, and after a fair amount of research, it, it's no single factor, it's a variety of factors, but there's this toxic soup of, of things in stormwater runoff that 
that result in the provo salmon dying before they have a chance to spawn. Zinc, copper, um, all of the other things, largely from vehicles and largely delivered by the road system to the creeks. So where do we go from here? Uh, potential solutions for sustainable living, whole systems, water balance approach, um, green stormwater infrastructure, quality of life, considerations, water as a resource, uh, multifunctional benefits of stormwater systems, some detailed hard work um, to develop plans for each community. They will all be different, um, but based on the same concepts. Uh, green stormwater solutions, low impact development, uh, stormwater parks. One of the things uh, we're trying to get our developed areas to function like forests. Um, oh, there's a slide I want to get to. No more stormwater prisons. The, on the left is what we started out making our, well, some engineers started out making look, our stormwater detention systems look like. They were trying to make them as small as they could so they lost as little land as possible in their development. But now we need to move to where it's more of a community amenity. And I want to mention here that um, we, we tend, one of the themes here is thinking broadly across disciplines, and we tend to um, forget the fact that there's a lot of research out there that shows growing up with green spaces and living with green spaces improves mental health. Long-term studies in Europe uh, and elsewhere show less mental health issues um, when people have access on a regular basis to green spaces. And it doesn't have to be a wilderness. It can be an urban park. Um, but there's just something that happens to us when we have a chance to get first-hand uh, contact with green spaces. So taking a, a green solution uh, rather than a structured solution, uh, we can remove most of the pollutants. We can reduce stormwater flows and volume. We can replenish our groundwater. Uh, we can reduce local flooding, uh, and we can create attractive uh, green spaces that are community amenities rather than just being an expense. This includes bioretention, rain gardens. Um, if we design them properly, the street trees, if you put an underground structure in there with the proper soil, um, and route stormwater into those that can become effective filters. So that's an example of something that can be done in a fairly intensively built out environment, uh, urban downtowns. Permeable pavement, it's still a fight to get this, um, but there's plenty of research out there that it's uh, very effective and durable um, approach. Green roofs, um, treatment wetlands, and infiltration systems. And finally, um, again, data is fine, but you must be able to show decision makers and the public that we are making a difference and being cost effective with funding. Story maps and videos can be very effective tools. So, and that's one of the things that, that Kim and I worked hard on, um, was to develop and to be able to tell stories. And that's what all of you can do in your communities is be able to tell a story. Showing up with a, a detailed engineering handbook uh, is not going to be very compelling, but if you can, you can show pictures and tell stories well, uh, whether it's one person or whether it's to a group, um, that's how we can make the biggest difference in moving forward. So with that, we'll open it up to discussion. Thank you.